The parody of Drama Outlander is not just any award-winning television show that is very popular with two lead actors of some of the best on-screen chemistry ever seen on television since The X-Files. But I must know. Do you want me? Whoever you are, James Fraser. Yes. I do want you. It is also a show that depicts 18th century Europe and the Americas in a very realistic manner. And with its seventh season currently being aired, this provides a great opportunity to go back and discuss some of the real history behind the television adaptation of Outlander. Even though Outlander's seven seasons cover a lot of historical time periods and subjects, but for this video we'll be focused on examining some of the historical topics shown in the first two seasons of the TV show. Historically, the two seasons take place from 1743 to 1746, in which the two main characters are forced to contend with the famous Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, the realities of life in 18th century Paris, France, and finally, court life in Versailles. With this being the case, in this video series, we will examine the political and military history behind the Jacobite Rebellion, and lastly, the realities of being a woman in the 18th century Western world. Hello everyone, Eric here. Before the rest of the video continues, I just want to quickly remind everyone that if you enjoy the content to please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and of course hit the bell notification so you can be alerted on when new videos drop here on the channel. All of these actions will greatly support the channel and will allow us to make even more awesome content. Now back to the video. When Claire ends up in the 18th century, she is thrust into the beginning stages of what become the Jacobite Rising of 1745. Throughout the show, audiences are given a solid rundown of how the Rising of 1745 unfolded and what led to its downfall. However, the show does not do a great job of explaining why the British Isles were going through this important event, which is what I want to explore in this part of the video. These causes being political opportunism, political resentment and economic hardship in Scotland, and finally, international politics. When discussing our first point, we had to turn to the events of 1688 in England that became known as the Glorious Revolution. While well, the Glorious Revolution would result in the creation of the Jacobite movement, there were a lot of things that would need to happen before it became a major political force. When James Stewart reclaimed the thrones of England, Scotland, and Ireland in 1685, Following the conclusion of the chaotic English Civil War, his conflict background was to be tolerated by the Protestant majority of England because his oldest daughter, the future Mary II, who was Protestant, was going to become the heir to the throne. That was until James II's wife, Mary Modena, gave birth to a son, James Francis Edward Stuart, who was going to be known as the Pretender Across the Sea, or the King James that is subtly mentioned throughout Outlander. God demands that a Catholic king sit on the English throne. My father is that king, having spent my early years in Italy where my father was forced to seek exile. And highly influential members of the British aristocracy who believe my father is the rightful heir to the English throne. He received the name Pretender because his father would be forced off the throne soon after James Francis Edward was born. Because there was a belief amongst many Protestants that feared a return of a Catholic monarch to the English throne. When it comes to King James's son, wild rumors began to spread amongst British Anglicans that the child had died stillborn and that the baby fitted as a new prince was an imposter smuggled into the royal birth chamber in a warming pan. Protestants also found it suspicious that everyone attending the birth was Catholic. To make matters worse for King James, his popularity amongst the English political elite began to dip as they began to believe that his rule was turning tyrannical, as he ruled by decree rather than allowing Parliament to take the lead in running the kingdom. These are just some of the reasons for the Glorious Revolution and the installation of Queen Mary to the thrones of Great Britain. This situation allowed for an event like the Jacobite Crisis to come to fruition. While this was the case, shortly following the Glorious Revolution, the Jacobite movement would only gain serious traction in Ireland due to the large Catholic majority of the country. In Scotland, the Jacobite movement became a serious political force 
for a number of different reasons that would be discussed later in the video. But the main event that would cause Jacobism to grow throughout Great Britain is when the English Parliament decided to have a German, German prince, George I, inherit the throne instead of a more straightforward candidate like James Francis Edward Stuart, when Mary and her younger sister Anne were unable to produce children of their own. According to Daniel Shetsy, Anne and Mary were able to stave off the power that would become Jacobism because of their Stuart heritage. George I, on the other hand, came to the throne not only as a foreign ruler who spoke poor English, as he was German from Hanover, he was also uncharismatic. His lack of Stuart heritage was only made worse by the fact that he decided to become increasingly aligned with the unpopular English Whig party at the expense of the more popular English Tories. This factor would lead to those in England becoming more attached to the Jacobite cause. While this was the case, Scotland would be the center of Jacobism. In Scotland, the creation of the Jacobite movement was built up very quickly due to several factors. They included political instability as a result of the swift introduction of the William and Mary government, as well as large levels of economic depression that was made worse by the failed harvests that were seen by many Scots as a curse brought upon by the new rulers. These factors create a lot of resentment towards the new government. However, the event that pushed many Scottish to join the Jacobite movement was the passage of the Act of Settlement, which stipulated that the English thrones of England and Scotland would be passed to Hanover or George I once Queen Anne had died. This enraged many political elites in Scotland as they were not consulted by the English Parliament when they enacted the law in London. The introduction of the Acts of Union, which brought together the crowns of England and Scotland, created a united parliament that placed Scotland at the mercy of English political desires. This situation created political resentment in Scotland, who were now unable to control their own destiny, as their representatives would be outnumbered by the English parliamentarians, who would be able to dictate policy in Scotland. This was mainly due to the fact that England has and still has a larger population than Scotland. Essentially, what the Acts of Union did was make England and Scotland one country called the United Kingdom, which still exists today and continues to be a major political issue. These factors would cause the 1715 Rising, which would occur a year after King George I took the throne in 1714. While many English Tories were thrown in prison before the actual Rising itself, the combined English and Scottish Jacobite forces actually outnumbered English government forces. But due to poor leadership during the early stages of the revolt, the Jacobite forces were unable to press their advantage. While the revolt was crushed, there was still a path for another large revolt to take place, such as the one that would occur in 1745. This situation was allowed to occur due to the political reality in Scotland following the rising of 1715, the treatment of Catholics and Scottish Episcopalians, and the continued economic depression that had lasted in Scotland since the beginning of the 18th century. Though the largest reason why the revolt occurred in 1745 can be traced to the renewed French rivalry with England. While much of the English support for the Jacobite cause would be silenced following the revolt in 1715, Many supporters were thought to be preparing a coup in the years following the revolt of 1715 who would actually be sent to jail or to America. At the same time, he writes that in Scotland, the majority of ordinary Scottish troops had actually escaped prosecution and the British Army's conduct in the Highlands caused many of the local populace to turn against the British and allow for many of its leaders to escape. Also, many elite Jacobites and their followers were pardoned either through their own connections or by the Indemnity Act of 1717 that gave a royal pardon to those who had taken part in the Rising of 1715. The lack of successful state repressions in Scotland, specifically against those who had actively taken part in the Jacobite Revolt of 1715, 
meant that there was still a large body of supporters who would be willing to rise up against the government, which would happen again some 30 years later in 1745. At the same time, when the government tried to enact revenge for the uprising, it actually created more enemies that would be motivated to resist the Crown's attempts at quashing Jacobite support in Scotland. Another feature that allowed the Jacobite movement to stay strong, especially in Scotland, was the poor economic conditions that continued to plague the region. Many Scottish believed that the government policy had a large role in creating the poor economic situation. Specifically, the level of taxation, such as the high tax on malt, which fell the most heavily on the less wealthy and the more numerous members of society, or known as the plebeians, who relied on it as a more important part of their diet than in England, and was generally of poor quality. This tax in particular resulted in the 1725 Shawfield Riots, where the Crowns revolted against the English MP or Member of Parliament for Gasglow, who voted for this tax. Another factor that elevated the Jacobite cause, especially in places like Scotland and Ireland, was the way in which Catholics and Scottish Episcopalians were treated. Catholics and non-jurors, non-jurors being Anglicans who would only swear loyalty to King James, provided fervent support for the Jacobite cause because they believed that the male Stuart line were the only ones who would be able to end the discrimination against them, especially for those who were Catholic. This is an idea that is well portrayed in Outlander. Surely your Uncle Lamb taught you some of this. Jacobite derived from Jacobus, the Latin for James, since they were followers of King James II, the Catholic king dethroned by the Protestants. Show sure. off. <laughs> That's it, quite right. So the Jacobites dedicated themselves to restoring a Catholic king. And but in actuality, it was Scottish Episcopalians who played a more important role in the Jacobite Risings, especially the one that would occur in 1745. Scottish Episcopalians were constantly attacked by their Presbyterian neighbors, who asked for government forces to harass them as they feared that the Episcopalians would overrun their religious way of life. The, the Crown of Return also found a lot of suspected Jacobite activity amongst the neighborhoods and villages where Scottish Episcopalians lived. This activity by the British Crown and their Presbyterian neighbors drove Scottish Episcopalians into the Jacobite camp. Their decision to join the Jacobites in such large numbers strengthened the cause greatly, mainly due to the large amount of Scottish Episcopalians who lived in Scotland. As Shetty writes, that only about 200,000 Catholics and non-jurors lived throughout mainland Britain, while there was at least 250,000 Episcopalians who lived in Scotland. While these factors allow for the Jacobite cause to stay alive, especially in Scotland, it was the French rivalry with the British that allowed the Jacobite cause to still have teeth in 1745. While the French were hesitant to involve themselves in the Jacobite conspiracy during the early 1700s, however, by the 1740s, they were willing to get involved in attacking their former allies in the British because the French felt that the British were prospering more from their alliance than they were. To achieve this objective, the French decided to launch a secret naval invasion of about 12,000 French troops who were to link up with Jacobite collaborators once they arrived in England. This was all to take place in 1744. However, a huge storm stopped this invasion, which forced the French to pivot by focusing their efforts on the European continent especially on attacking the Austrian Netherlands. In the show, Claire and Jamie arrive in France in 1744, the same year this invasion was attempted. However, there is no mention of this invasion when the two characters land in France, and the show makes it seem like that the French had no history of being involved with the Jacobites in the first place. Our involvement in Austria has depleted our resources. The king is not inclined to fund another foreign adventure. Tell Prince Charles what you told me. That King Louis has
has no intention of funding the rebellion. You want to discourage Prince Charles from mounting your rebellion? Additionally, the show makes it seem like that it was only in 1744 that high-level Jacobite and French talks were occurring. In reality, the king and his ministers were directly involved with the Jacobites way before Jamie and Claire arrived in France, as the French crown had sent out the master stables, James Butler, to meet with English Tories about a possible French invasion. After Butler returned to France to give his report, Louis felt that the Tories were generally ready for a possible invasion. While the show does betray that the French were unwilling to support an invasion in late 1744 and 45, the relationship between the French and Charles Edward Stuart is a bit more complicated than what Outlander implies. Charles Edward's landing in 1745 was not actually sanctioned by his father or the French. If anything, when Charles decided to land in Scotland in 1745, without French support, this is done without the French even knowing that he was going to do this, as Charles Edward feared that they may stop him from invading with a smaller force of men in arms. As Schutzian notes that the French only found out about Charles Edward's plan when he sent a letter to Louis XV when he was already on the verge of leaving to Scotland. If Claire and Jamie really wanted to stop Culloden from happening, then they could have just told the French what Charles Edward was planning when they arrived in France in 1744. While this may be the case, Alar does portray the military campaign and the results of the Rising of 45 with a lot of historical accuracy. So I won't talk about it in this video, but the one thing I do want to discuss briefly is what were the objectives of the Rising of 1745 as it relates to Scotland. One way we can figure out this perspective is by examining the proclamation given by King James in 1743 in which he argues James VIII, by grace of God, King of Scotland, England, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, etc., to all our loving subjects, having always borne the most constant affection to our ancient kingdom of Scotland, from whence we derive our royal origin, we cannot but behold with the deepest concern the miseries they suffer under a foreign usurpation and the intolerable burdens daily added to their yoke. We see nation reduced to the condition of a province under the specious pretense of a union with a more powerful neighbor. In consequence of this pretended union, grievous and unprecedented taxes have been laid on and levied with severity in spite of all representations that could be made to the contrary, and these have not failed to produce that poverty and decay of trade, which were easily foreseen to be the necessary consequences of such oppressive measures. While there was an opportunity to make Scotland a totally independent kingdom with its own monarch and parliament, instead, James and his supporters decided to pursue a system of government that more closely reflected a political world that existed before the Acts of Union and, of course, the Acts of Settlement. Now that we've discussed the history behind Jacobism and the rising of 1745, as seen in Outlander, in the next video, we will discuss another topic that is well covered within the show. This topic is the experience of women in the 18th century Western world.